to have the people take away in the reciting of that. It tells about his creative power. He, he hangs the stars, the heavens, the moon. He does all of this. And every, every response, that is, they're testimonies of, of the enduring mercy, the steadfast love. Some, some versions say the, the chesed is the Hebrew word. It's the, it's the covenant love of God. They were taught that when they looked at the stars and the moon, and the sun, the, the, the movements in the heavens, the, the movements in the seasons, that they were to remember that God is a God of covenant love. And they were told one another, reminded the children of the great rescue God had performed to the people of Israel. It was a reminder that, that He's the God of covenant love. He does everything He does. Get this now. He does everything He does as an outworking of His covenant. as we heard in the video, to save his people from their sin. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. We want to look at these for a few moments today and think about the wonder of God's mercy. I want to ask you to stand with me if you would as I... We just read what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And oh, this Word. How we need this today. We need to be reminded of this today. It's at the heart of who Jesus is. And the Lord help us as we look through the Scripture today. To either, to one of two things. To be thankful that we, have, we are the blessed recipients of saving mercy. Or to become aware for the first time that we need this mercy. And it is available to sinners. Thank you. Please be seated. One of the most essential qualities of God is His mercy. It describes that quality by which He faithfully keeps His promises and maintains His covenant relationship with His people despite their unworthiness and unfaithfulness. When you unpack the biblical meaning of this term, Old Testament, hesed, and some other words that come into play, New Testament, elios. You see it's a many-faceted diamond. And you'll find many synonyms in, in the scriptures linked to it. Uh, kindness, loving kindness, goodness, grace, favor, pity, compassion, steadfast love, which is, the, which is the term that the English Standard Version uses. When we read what we read today, I, I took the English Standard Version uh, of Psalm 136 and came back to the, to the New King James rendering of his mercy endures forever rather than his steadfast love endures forever. The same thing. Prominent in the concept of mercy is the compassionate disposition to forgive an offender or adversary and to help or spare him or her from their sorry circumstances. 
the New Testament, which we've read the word in, in Mark's gospel, it speaks of Jesus' mercy toward the needy. It's his, it's his pity and compassion by means of uh, the idea of, it literally means, hang on now, to be moved in one's bowels. Now get this, because the, the Hebrews thought linear. Think like a Hebrew for a moment. About, about the midway between in your body from, from head to toe is right here. And so they saw that as the center of compassion. The affections. Jesus is described in the scripture as, as being fervently moved in his inner feeling, showing benevolence toward the needy and spontaneously acting to relieve their suffering. Someone has said it this way. That mercy is the pity of God upon the sinner's condition that moves him to show grace, his unconditional love and favor. This is a wonderful word. And I want us to see in this text today just three things, and then we're going to look at a fourth to kind of tie some things together. The three things I want you to see in the text are, first of all, this blind man cries out for mercy. Second, I want you to see the rebuke of the many. Third, the response of Jesus. And then, th that's the text, all right? And then the fourth, we want to think a few minutes about the wonder of God's mercy as it, as it is manifested in, in the Gospels. First of all, this blind man cries out for mercy. Look what we're told about it. We're just, we're just told briefly in two sentences, he comes to Jericho and he leaves Jericho. We know this, though, that when he leaves Jericho, a, a great crowd is following him. And that's not unusual. We've been studying through Mark, and we, we know that Jesus, in a season of his ministry, attracted great crowds. They'd heard about him. His reputation preceded him. But sitting by the roadside is this fellow we know as Bartimaeus. Now, his, his name's Timaeus. Bar in front of it simply means he's the son of Timaeus. So Bartimaeus. He's sitting. The crowd is moving past. And when he heard, and this, the, the buzz, you can hear the, the crowd talking. This, is, that, is that Jesus? Is that... The, is that the, the fellow who performs the miracles? Is that the, is that the man who's been confounding the religious elite? Is that Jesus of Nazareth? When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, and I get the picture here. This is the repetition, the, the, the verbal use here, and it's, it's captured in this form. He began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he keeps on and on and on. And it becomes a, a, it disturbs the peace. It disturbs the, the proceedings. Now you wonder sometimes how many, how many religious situations unwittingly fall to this. You see, you have, you have the man keenly aware of his need and, and fully convinced that this one who's passing by, if he can get his attention, if he can, if he can arrest just a few minutes with him, that his need will be met. And you have this crowd, this great crowd following. And that's the second thing we see is this, this, how does the crowd respond? They rebuke him. We've seen it before. We've seen it before. Not as big a crowd where the disciples were following Jesus and, and, and mothers wanted to bring their children to Jesus. And, and the disciples said he doesn't have time for children. And Jesus as much as says, are you kidding me? That's primarily what I have time for. <laughs> Let them come to me. Do not forbid them. Sometimes we need to recognize, folks, religion gets in the way of the gospel. These folks were fascinated to follow Jesus, to hear what they could hear from him and see what they would see from him. And perhaps themselves even be personally benefited, but they were not interested not even keenly aware of those around them who had great need. Oh, wouldn't you long to, to read this passage and it say that, that someone real, as they were following Jesus and talking about, this is Jesus of Nazareth, that someone recognized there's a blind beggar sitting here. Get him, get him. Jesus can help him. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love for the narrative to go that way? But it doesn't. 
Many times it doesn't. Yet it should. Their rebuke to him is a rebuke to any of us who would get so busy in what we would call the things of God that we would walk right past someone who has great need, knowing that need could be met in Jesus. That's the danger here. They, they rebuked him. They said, be, be quiet, be silent. But I love this. When you have a great need and you're convinced that Jesus can meet the need, you're not going to be silent. In fact, their, their rebuke says he cried out all the more. Had the opposite effect. They were hoping they could shame him. Shh! This is Jesus of Nazareth. Don't you know who he is? Don't, don't carry on like that. Embarrass yourself and, and make all of us look foolish. He cried all the more. Son of David, have mercy. Now what's he saying when he calls him son of David? If you know, if you know the Old Testament, there was a promise, a covenant promise made to David that, that he would not fail ultimately to have one of his heirs sit on the throne. And it was a, it was a messianic promise that, that the son of David... Someone from David's line, his lineage, would be Messiah. When he calls Jesus son of David, he is saying to him, Messiah, the promised one, mercy me. And that's where the narrative is. He has a great need. The crowd is impervious to his need or complacent or just not caring about his need. They're, they're not following Jesus out of a sense of people's needs being met. What a tragedy. So we have the response of Jesus. And this is where it gets really exciting. Jesus stopped. Get the picture. There's a great crowd. A lot of noise. A lot of a lot of buzz. He's walking with the twelve. And typically when he's walking with the twelve, he's teaching them. It's, I told you before the term that's used, he was a peripatetic teacher. He, he taught as he walked. Consider the lilies of the field. Look at the birds. He, he was teaching, constantly teaching them. And so he was walking along and there's a ruckus on the side of the road. Here's his name. He's listening. The crowd who, who you would like to think is following him because they want to know more from him, they want to be like him, yet they act the exact opposite from, from his heart. And he stops. And folks, when he stops, the crowd stops. There they are. And he said to his disciples, those closest to him, call him. Let us go get him. So they, some of these, some of the twelve, went to him and said, be encouraged. Take heart. Take heart. Get up. He is calling you. They didn't even have to say who was calling him. Get up. Take heart. Get encouraged. Get ready. He is calling you. Well, the man, sitting wrapped in his cloak, throws his cloak off because it would hinder his movement. He's going quick as he can. He sprang up, came to Jesus. Jesus looks upon him. What do you want me to do for you? Now Jesus doesn't ask this question because he doesn't know. Jesus asks questions. You need to learn this of him. If you read through the Gospels, Jesus oftentimes will meet a question with a question. He asks the questions. He, he draws people out. He lets them take a stand, make, drive a stake. He, he lets them declare themselves. He puts them in a situation 
or they must speak. What do you want me to do for you? But he didn't hesitate to answer. Rabbi, which, which means he, he respects him as a teacher. Let me recover my sight. Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. We're told immediately he recovered his sight. That's interesting. Jesus said, go your way. He recovered his sight and followed him, followed Jesus on the way. You see, when you have an encounter with Jesus that is life-changing, your way becomes his way. Your way becomes the way of following him. When he healed the Gadarin demoniac, which we looked at in Mark 5, the man said, please let me go with you. Jesus said, no, not now. You, you need to go back and tell family and friends what great things the Lord has done and how he has had mercy on you. So even then, when he went back, when the demoniac went back into his town, his village, he was going Jesus' way. Folks, that's, that's the mark. That's the mark. That's why we talk about following Jesus day by day. When we have been changed by Jesus, I mean irrevocably changed by Jesus, His way becomes our way. Not perfectly. That's, that's why we need mercy. <laughs> we need mercy to be drawn savingly to Him. And we need mercy every day of our lives. His forgiveness. I want us to look just for a few minutes at the, the wonder of, God, of God's mercy. Because you see, I want you to know something. If you've never noticed this before in, in the Gospels, notice it now. Every time in the New Testament a living person cried out, cried aloud for mercy, for Jesus to have mercy. Jesus showed him mercy. There are people who met Jesus and walked away sorrowful from him. There are people who met Jesus and were offended by him. But every time a living person cried out, have mercy, Jesus showed him mercy. Let's look real quickly. In Matthew 9, verses 27 to 30, we're told about two blind men who were following him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Jesus kept walking. He enters a house. The blind men come to him. Jesus said, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And then Jesus said, Now, don't tell anyone about this. It was the, we talked about this when it came up, the messianic secret about it. it wasn't time for him to unveil himself completely, but also the difficulty. How could you keep that to yourself? <laughs> you can see. You couldn't see. You were probably known in the village as the two, the two blind guys. Someone sees you reading. That makes for interesting conversation. Mercy met. Need met. Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. He, he withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying. Again, notice this over and over. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. This is the situation you remember where he didn't immediately answer her. The disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away. She's, she's crying out after us. She's making a commotion. We, we don't need this. He answered to her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog. She's a Gentile. 
He's testing her. He's doing some things to get a crowd response. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Well, I'm not asking to sit at the table. I just need your crumbs. Your crumbs will meet my daughter's need. Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Mercy met. Met. Matthew 17, 14 to 18. They came to the crowd. A man came up to him, kneeling before him, said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire, often into the water, and I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. Jesus answered, O faithless, twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. Lord, have mercy. Met. Met. Matthew 20, verses 29 to 34. They went out of Jericho and a great crowd followed them. Some wonder if this is the same narrative, but it tells about two blind men. There were two blind men sitting by the roadside and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. He stopped. What do you want me to do? Lord, let our eyes be opened. In pity, he touched their eyes. Immediately, they recovered their sight and followed him. Suppose it was another blind man with Bartimaeus, but suppose it was two different blind men. It doesn't really matter, finally. Here's the point. Mercy cried for, mercy given. And then Mark 10, the passage we just read of Bartimaeus. Then Luke 17, verses 12 and 14, 14. He entered a village, was met by 10 lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Outcasts. You had leprosy. You had to warn people you were coming. You had to shout. If you went into a situation that was going to be populated, otherwise you stayed in your leper colony. But if you went into the towns or the villages, you had to cry out, Leper coming! Leper coming! Beware! Leper coming! What a way to live. Ten of them from the colony. Have mercy on us. And if they experienced a remission of leprosy or a healing from leprosy, they would go to show themselves to the priest who would, who would verify that, yes, now you can function among the public again. Mercy. There's the occasion in recording Luke's gospel when, when, the, when the Pharisee and the, and the publican go to pray. Jesus tells about this. And the publican prays, and, I mean, the Pharisee prays and says, Lord, I want to thank you for how you made me a Pharisee. I'm thankful I'm not like this guy. Oh, mercy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. That I am, I'm, I'm thankful I had an upbringing that teaches me to tithe and go to synagogue and all. He just goes on and on. Then the text tells us the publican would not even lift up his eyes. His head was bowed. And the scripture says he began to beat upon his chest. His, his sense of his sinfulness, of his sinful heart was so intense, he beat upon his chest and all he could say was, mercy me. Mercy, a noun, was turned into a verb. Act in mercy toward me. And Jesus says, I tell you, the publican went home justified. You see, every time in the New Testament. You can do a search on your, if you have Bible apps, do a search for mercy and just, just trace it out in the Gospels every time. Mercy cried out for, mercy shown. 
except one time. There's a haunting exception. I want us to look at this for a few minutes. It's one of the most bone-chilling passages of Scripture in the Gospels. In Luke 16, 19 to 26, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man, the beggar Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, notice the contrast. Lazarus, the, the poor man, was carried to Abraham's bosom. A, a symbol, a picture for being with God. Carried by angels. All we're told about the rich man is he died and was buried. And in Hades, the abode of the dead, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off. It's a pretty powerful picture. Do you know that, that the departed dead who go to the everlasting fire can see into heaven? And Lazarus at his side and he called out, Father Abraham. In other words, now he's appealing to his Jewishness. Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in this flame. He cried for mercy. Just like every other situation in the gospel, someone cried for mercy. And Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to, to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. The cry for mercy. Too late. Too late. The most haunting word in that whole passage to me is remember. You see, in, in heaven, we're going to have a glorified body, a glorified conscience. We'll, we'll be back to where Adam and Eve were when they were first created, except even better. Adam had full capacity of his mind when he, began, when he named the entire animal kingdom. We will be better than that. In hell, however, there is an unsanctified conscience, a condemned conscience that is just as quick and quickened, and memory, not only the, the feeling of eternal pain, not only the observation of the joy of heaven, but memory, the remembrance of every time anyone had spoken to him, had told him about his need of God. And he brushed it off because he was a rich man. He fared sumptuously. He didn't have need of anything. He wasn't aware of any needs he had. Needs were, 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 were Lazarus' problem, not his problem. And he would remember for all of eternity. That's haunting. I, I lived a season in my life where I was religious but lost. Had I perished, I would have spent eternity hearing the prayers of my mother pleading for God to have mercy on me. Hearing the overtures of Sunday school teachers of, of people who love me telling me the love of Jesus and pleading with me to come to Christ. The, the Scriptures I had memorized as a child would, a perfect memory, a haunting memory in hell. Mercy cried out for in hell and mercy refused. Oh, the lesson here is that as long as you have breath, there is mercy available in Christ. As long as there's pink under your fingernail, there's mercy available in Christ. But when you cross over into death, it is too late. It will be too late. One of my favorite books, you know, is Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan, an immortal classic. And one of the favorite sections for me in that is when, 
when Christian and faithful have gone through Vanity Fair and faithful is martyred in Vanity Fair but before he is martyred he encounters a, a young soul named Hopeful and he shares the gospel with Hopeful and though faithful is martyred Hopeful and Christian come out of Vanity Fair on the way and they go through some interesting portions but there's there's a point in their journey when Christian asks him how did you come to think at first of so doing as you have done. In other words, what, what happened in your mind to make you think about becoming a follower of Jesus? You mean, how did I begin to look after the good of my soul? Yes, that's my meaning, he says. Well, he talks about how he enjoyed Vanity Fair and then, and then Faithful shared with him. And, and he began to talk about it's one, of, it's one of the best passages. If you would like this, if you don't have Pilgrim's Progress, if you'll contact Linda Hare in the office, we'll send you, we can email you this, print it out for you. It's one of the best descriptions of coming to faith in Christ outside of the scripture you're ever going to find. They go back and forth and back and forth, but he talks about how he began to fall under conviction. And then finally, Christian asks him, did you have answers? No, the Lord didn't answer me when I first began to cry out. He said, there was a time when I thought everything was okay, but I would go back to my grief and my misery. He says, well, what did you think to do? He said, do? I, I could not tell what to do until I shared with faithful my concern and he told me that unless I could obtain the righteousness of a man that never had sinned, neither my own nor all the righteousness of the world could save me. He said, though I found that hard to believe, I, I had to take his word for it and I began to confess my sin. And he went back and forth and back and forth. He said, finally, I asked him further, how, how do I make supplication to this God who sits on a mercy seat? He said, go and you'll find him upon a mercy seat where he sits all the year long to give pardon and forgiveness to them that come. I said, I don't know what to say when I come. He said, say to this effect, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and make me to know and believe in Jesus Christ. For I see that if his righteousness had not been, or if I do not have faith in that righteousness, I'm utterly cast away. Lord, I've heard that you're a merciful God, and you've ordained that your son Jesus Christ should be the Savior of the world. Moreover, that you are willing to bestow him upon such poor sinners as I am, and I am a sinner indeed. Lord, take therefore this opportunity and magnify your grace in the salvation of my soul through your son Jesus Christ. He said, did he? He said, not the first time I asked. No, the second. No, the third. No, the fourth. No, the fifth. Not even the sixth. He said, what did you purpose to do? He said, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I reasoned with myself that if I, if I cease, if I stop begging for mercy, the worst I can do is die at the throne of grace. You thought about giving up? Oh, a couple of hundred times I thought about giving up, but no, I reasoned. I must continue. And so he continued to cry out to God. And he showed him mercy. And he saved him. And he said he was so filled with awe and wonder when mercy came to him. Oh, brothers and sisters, the devil will beat you up with your sin. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, He will magnify your sin. What we must learn to do is see that mercy has been shown to us for that. We've been forgiven. And we magnify the blood of Jesus Christ, the power of Christ to save us. And there's some here today who have not ever seriously confronted your sinfulness and your need for mercy. You think, well, I'll, I'll just do better. I'll, I'll try harder. I'll, I'll quit this. I'll quit that. I'll start this. I'll start that. And none of that, none of that is helpful. 
You need the mercy of God and it is there for you, available to you. How can you say that, preacher? Because you're still alive. But one day you and I will not be. And it will be too late, though, though when we are gone, we will want mercy. When we pass from life to death into eternal flames, we will beg for mercy. We will cry out for mercy. We will be keenly aware of our need for mercy. And mercy will not be given. There is a great gulf fixed, and you don't cross it. My plea with you today, if you know Christ, is never lose the wonder of His mercy. Never doubt His willingness to show mercy to those you encounter in the way. And if you're here and you've not yet come to know Jesus Christ, never doubt His willingness to show you mercy today if you will cry out to Him, Jesus, Messiah, Savior, Lord, have mercy on me. Where are you? You either have mercy or you're in need of mercy. And both of those are okay if you want mercy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we bow before You in Jesus' name. And so grateful, so grateful that You are a merciful God, that You do sit on the mercy seat, that You're there always willing to give pardon and forgiveness to any sinner, no matter, no matter a religious sinner who looks good but isn't, or the, or the worst scoundrel in the world, that You're there to give mercy, to show salvation, forgiveness of sins to all who will come to You by faith simply on the basis of the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. My prayer, dear God, is that those of us here who have been the recipients of Your mercy would, would never, never outlive our sense of a need for mercy. That It's Your mercy that shows us every day. Your goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. Help us to know that and live that and believe that and embrace that and rejoice in that. And then, Lord, for those who have not yet seen their need of mercy or seen Your willingness to show mercy, oh, I pray that You would break in today. And then before this day is out, they would be found crying out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And you would show them mercy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.